Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited to be talking to both of you. How are you, Amanda? Yeah. I'm good. How are you, Amanda? I'm good. I have spoken to Naya in the past, but Amanda, I'm really, really excited to talk to you about Unplug and to kind of learn what your mission is, what you're doing, what you've been doing, how long you've been doing this and like the origin story and what it looks like now and what the vision is for the future too. Um, as you know, I've been having these conversations with women who identify as plus, fat, curve. And one of the coolest things that I've, I've realized through these conversations is that women who don't identify as fat or curvy or plus or are, feel like they're part of this community aren't even aware that this is a community that A, exists and B, that feels marginalized at all. And one of my favorite things about this has been just like sharing this information and making people aware that this is a real thing that women face and that we're trying to fight through. So that being said, please tell me about Unplug. Sure, Unplug started as a need that I had in so many ways. So I think the first thing was that I was struggling with an eating disorder at the time, but I didn't believe myself because I didn't really see other people who looked like me struggling with it in public or in media. And I was lucky enough to be in therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapy, which is the only reason I got validated that this was real. Otherwise, you know, I would have just continued to restrict because people in larger bodies are just told to restrict anyway. Um, but it was having like really bad effects on my physical health. And I felt like, okay, I feel like I'm healing inside of the therapy office, but then as soon as I leave, the entire world is encouraging these behaviors. So it really just started on my personal Instagram where I said, hey, I literally don't know how to build a website, but I made like a Wix blog. If anyone wants to share their stories, let me know and I'll share it. And like did not expect that much outpouring of stories. And at the time, it wasn't specifically to do with bodies. It was just like, if you're experiencing something, reach out. And then it just so happened that every single person i mean my community is majority black women and femmes so all of us were experiencing something to do with existing in our bodies and being policed by other people or policing ourselves mm -hmm. um and i realized like there really needs to be a space to talk about this and on top of it you know as i decided okay maybe this shouldn't be on my personal instagram anymore maybe this deserves to be a real space and i made my own Instagram account for it, I realized if my my eating disorder recovery cannot be about me. Mm -hmm. it, and that, I, that was something that I realized very quickly um, because at the time of my ED diagnosis, I was actually in, I wouldn't consider the body that I was in to be plus size at the time. And I think that also is why I was able to get that diagnosis. And even though I thought I was, and even though I would, I would have probably use the word fat to describe myself as a negative descriptor, which now I know is just absolutely incorrect. But at the time, I wasn't wearing plus size clothes. So I could not co-op that experience. And at the same time, I realized if, my, if I make my eating disorder about my body, then I'm not actually solving the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realized like real eating disorder recovery had to include every single body, particularly marginalized bodies, um, particularly bodies that we're not seeing because the root of many eating disorders is a fear of fatness and not just a fear of fatness, but an actual violence towards fat bodies. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to hear, you know, the more I did research as well, and the more that I wanted to create this feed and this space that made me feel like bodies could exist and bodies could fluctuate because without that, how was I supposed to heal? And social media was a place that I was spending so much time in. And I think we can all kind of identify with wanting to scroll through a feed that makes us feel good. And that's really difficult with the world that we live in. Um, so I, I really could go on and on about the beginning of Unplug, but it's amazing to see how it continues to grow, but like also continues 
to feed off of that same mission and that same need that I had. Um, because I know that just so many other people have the, those needs and they're just not being addressed. Mm -hmm. I think that what you said about like, right, and not being about yourself, but it being about a greater mission or a greater community that you're able to create. And that has also, I similarly like have experienced that where it's like, you can't heal unless you have the community to heal with. Like it's so much about being able to lean on one another and hearing other people's experiences and realizing I'm not alone in this, right? Even though, like you said, there are so many external factors that have taught us to believe or to, to force us to believe that it is such a solitary experience when it really is not. And I like so appreciate the community that you've built so far and can't wait to see it grow and become bigger and more people know about it. So Naya, if you don't mind, can you introduce yourself and talk about your experience with Unplug and how you two know each other? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm Naya, so I'm head of PR for the Unplug Collective. And me and Amanda met, um, of course, via Instagram, um, for the beginning of Dear Fashion Industry. And I was asked to model for the campaign and, you know, almost write a letter to talk about, you know, what needs to change in the fashion industry, which I'm always down to talk about something that needs to change. So <laughs> um, that's just kind of how we got introduced. Um, I sent content to her. And I mean, ever since then, it just has been a, such a genuine connection. Um, and then later on, I probably say about a year later, which is this current year, um, I think Amanda or the Unplug Collective, uh, they made a post saying that they're hiring. And I'm just like, wait a minute what? Because <laughs> one thing that I appreciate about Unplug is that it's never felt like, you know, a machine. It's always felt so genuine, so real. And, you know, it doesn't feel like a singular person. Like, you know, she is not Unplug Collective. It's really everyone. So I've always fell in love with that idea. And, you know, hearing that they needed someone, I was like, I want to be a part of this, you know? I mean, fortunately, I'm so grateful. I think I applied for the content creation role, but I ended up being head of PR, which Actually, I'm more excited about because I have a like a deep love for just connecting people, finding new people, and just bringing them to you know together with Unplug and vice versa. So that's how we met, and that's what I'm doing, and I'm enjoying it. Everyone's so amazing. So yeah, I first saw you and met you through Unplug. Yeah, uh, remind me again what the name of the campaign is. Dear fashion, fashion industry. Dear fashion industry. Right. Like, I, I guess I want to like talk about specific moments in Unplug's kind of arc, right? You've talked about fashion and loving clothing and like, there are a lot of barriers when it comes to living in a larger body and the accessibility of fashionable clothing that's accessible to people who can't walk into a designer store who can't walk into a lot of fast fashion stores, um, who can't walk into like boutiques in cities, whatever it is. What did that mean to you? And why were you particularly excited about that campaign? Um, I mean, it meant the world to me. My entire life I've had to, you know, pull from, you know, my inspiration is pulled from people that don't look like me. So I'm constantly having to figure out, okay, well, how can I, you know, copy paste that and put it on me? And then when you're in this world where you're constantly restricted and even in fast fashion, you can't find something also in designer, you can't find something. I'm always having to just build and create my own. Um, so it was important to me to just kind of tell my story with that and also just, you know, provide the message saying, I'm tired of building. I'm tired of having to make things work. I, why can't things just work for me? So that was kind of the perspective that I was really speaking from because, you know, it's, it's exhausting having to go shopping with your friends and they can go in this, that, and all the other stores. And then you have to be like, okay, well, when I get home, I got to figure it out. Cause you know, this doesn't fit me, but I want this to look good, you know? So that's really, um, which kind of struck me. And that's the story that I kind of told from. And that's the story that I still tell cause I'm still struggling, but, um, we're making it work. We're making it work. But that was how important it was to me. And Amanda, as you built this community, have you found that there are like, what topics have you gravitated towards? What stories have you learned are, um, people want to share with other people, people want to be a part of. What have, what have you learned along the way? So many things. <laughs> so many things, of course. Um, I, think, I think the overarching thing is that the medical community, just the way that the world functions in general, splits the mind and the body. 
So mm. it says, this is mental health, this is physical health. Um, this is how you think, this is how you feel, this is how, you know, it just has this very one dimensional approach to the way that the body works. And we're seeing through, you know, research, I mean, I'm in college right now. And so I see it almost as like ethnography, like actually reaching out to people, hearing their stories and archiving information that otherwise would not be written down. And it's so important to, in order to preserve the stories and the histories of marginalized people to actually see it written down in an archive. It's why, you know, so much of, of our history has been lost is because we weren't able, we didn't get the privilege to do that. And so now seeing that and feeling the ways in which particularly Black femmes and Black women um, move through the world, we know that someone's mental health is influenced by their physical health. Someone's physical health is influenced by their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these things that, you know, we talk about um, in a larger sense. So, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are finally reckoning with the fact that, you know, not having clothes that fit everyone mm -hmm. is bad. Mm -hmm. That's the bare minimum. It's the bare minimum. And there's unfortunately still some people who aren't there yet. Um, I'm not sure, you know, the idea that people should lose weight um, and then find clothes. So should everyone walk around naked? I'm just trying to understand. Like, mm -hmm. I, the fact that this isn't like a dire issue and that people aren't, you know, literally boycotting fashion companies that don't carry sizes beyond a certain size is like above and beyond me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think on top of that, what we're finding is, you know, and this is also because I'm studying psychology as well, when people are being oppressed or they're being treated violently in their body, it has physical health and mental health effects. Mm -hmm. So stress is deeply correlated with, you know, mental health issues mm -hmm. as well. And these, these, these issues of going to a store and leaving without clothes it's not just about fashion, like fashion is a buzzword, but if you have a job that you're applying to, that you need to quote unquote present yourself in a certain way, and black women and femmes are our judge based on how we present ourselves, mm -hmm. then how are we supposed to feel um, at ease? You know, so these, these, what I've learned is that it's a web, it's all connected, and we can't, you know, talk about mental health or talk about physical health without talking about the way that others are treating us and the way that um, they're all interconnected. So, you know, I found that people's stories are often about the intersections of all of those things, um, whether it's, you know, talking about mental health um, and particularly mental illness, because I think people are scared of that word, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's something that a lot of people struggle with, whether it's anxiety, depression, or illnesses that people are even more afraid to talk about, like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and dissociative identity disorder and you know things like that that are literally trauma responses they're coping mechanisms and so of course people who have been through trauma and stress are going to find different coping mechanisms um or survival mechanisms um so there's a mental health element there's a lot of stories about medical discrimination going into doctor's offices for coughs and leaving with nutritionist appointments and you know being violently attacked you know i don't see this as just acute conversation these are things that can create ptsd for people mm -hmm. these are things that can create barriers from people wanting to ever go back to the doctor again mm -hmm. um and these are things that often ignore eating disorders and the way that people already relate to food and already relate to their body so i mean literally if you go on the website um the unplugcollective.com you'll see that there's no limit to the kinds of stories and what people talk about but as i said i think they're all about the interconnectedness of the mind and the body and the way that community can help us to restore that but also can hurt if we're not aware of our actions and their consequences mm -hmm. absolutely so you kind of mentioned you talked about right obviously the medical community but then um this idea of oh, am I supposed to lose weight in order to fit in? Like, what is the alternative of that? And how have you seen um, this narrative of obesity is bad, you should lose weight, you know, 
big, can't be beautiful because that means that you're not healthy when in reality, you have no idea what my insides look like. Mm -hmm. For people who say that to you or say that to, to anybody, right? Like you should lose weight because it's not healthy. What do you say back to that? I mean, I would say mind your business. Yeah. <laughs> I got a smart mouth, so. <laughs> I? I said I got a smart mouth, so. It's all <laughs> mind your business. Um, I think health, no one owes you health. Um, right. And the fact that medical discrimination exists means that people in larger bodies' health is being neglected. That's a fact. And as I said before, the fact that mental health influences so much, which is not, as I said, it's not addressed. It's like you go to the doctor for maybe like back pain, which yeah. has been my experience. I have back pain. Um, I went, I left New York, which is where I was going to college. I went to Jamaica for a year. My back pain disappeared. Like, I'm not kidding. Um, and so I, I do think my back pain had a lot to do with stress. And every, any time I am stressed out, um, my back starts to hurt. Right. right. Every time I went to a doctor, they said I needed to lose weight and that was the problem. And that is dangerous. Um, so I think health and weight being so often correlated mm -hmm. is the most reductive and like stupid thing, mm -hmm. but yet it's so forceful and it's so prevalent and it's so it's giving the girls eugenics, like it's giving the girls um, obsession with standardizing bodies. Um, I don't see people walking around saying, you know, everyone's eyes should be blue, but I did see that at one time. And we can look back in history and know that it was very charged and there was motive. And I think you need to look deeper into, you know, where where is this information coming from? What's missing from the information? Um, someone who has an illness in a bigger body doesn't mean that bigger bodies cause illness. There's actually not a single illness that only exists in larger bodies. Um, so I would also ask people to think about that. When you were talking about restriction also, right? Like diet culture has totally like tainted our ideas of what we're allowed to eat every single day. I mean, I think about it all the time of, I mean, especially in quarantine, right? Like I haven't moved a lot in the last year. I've definitely put on like 20 plus pounds. And because of it, now I have to like backtrack and, and realize like all the learning that I've done about like, it's okay, right? Like you don't have to adhere to a specific weight just because, um, you you're told that you're supposed to like how do you feel checking in with myself and making sure that i feel okay um similar to you the intuitive eating and like eating when i need to or when i want to like and and having that peace with myself has been very important because it can be a war on yourself to like right. get so angry with yourself and and then figuring out like where is that coming from who is why, why am i so upset with myself right so true. It's not like kind of emotional to be honest. It's just you know, so much time is spent yeah. depriving our bodies of what they need. And in our team learning, we do team learnings behind the scenes so that we can kind of cultivate the same environment on the page within our own space. And we read this book called Health at Every Size by Lindo Bacon and it's about you know, intuitive eating and particularly the fact that everyone's body has a set point um, and that has it, that when you feed your body based on your hunger cues, your body finds homeostasis. Homeostasis may be 500 pounds and it might be 120. Right. So everyone, it doesn't mean that once you start feeding yourself, you'll get mm -hmm. skinny and lose weight. It means that our bodies know where they naturally sit mm -hmm. um, and that's genetic. And so, unfortunately, when we starve ourselves and we starve our bodies, we get further and further away from what our body needs. Right. We, we actually start to forget what hunger even feels like. Right. And, that, and, and, and anorexia is pretty much that. It's being so estranged, estranged from your personal needs um, that you no longer eat that you completely starve yourself and i know that there are so many people in larger bodies who do that and it's not for fun it's because there are societal messages that are constantly telling you that this is the way to get approval and as 
human beings, we seek out approval. It's our instinct, it's our biology. So not only are we asking people in larger bodies to go against their biology um, by starving themselves, but also to go against their biology when we tell when we tell all of us to love ourselves mm-hmm. as is. So it doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. That's not the society that we live in. Um, and so to put the onus on us instead of putting it on everyone to change the way that they relate to food and bodies it's really sad and it's really violent because this is this is really really harming people um it, it really really is harming people it, it feels i don't think we get into the the nitty gritty of just how hellish it feels mm-hmm. to live in a world where you are constantly fighting your own body mm-hmm. that is not something anyone deserves mm-hmm. And, and, and it has been normalized for the sake of capitalism, for the sake of diet culture being such, an, mm-hmm. such an, um, a lucrative industry, but it doesn't actually make sense. Why should people feel bad for nourishing themselves? And I think there are so many people who genuinely believe, well, if I don't, and I was one of them, I would say things like, if I, if I keep ice cream in the house, I'm gonna eat it. Mm-hmm. Um, if I eat, you know, I, and, and I, had the chance during quarantine to really sit with this because I've been in therapy for two years. A therapist kept saying, there's no good and bad food. And I said, fuck you. Like, yes, there is. (laughs) Um, I said, I gain weight by, I used to say things like, I gain weight by inhaling food. Like I, I just gain weight easier than everyone else. Like I can't have those things around me. And I think a lot of people who have, you know, different biological makeups like there are things like people who have less insulin they burn fat less so that they, they do gain weight easier and we know that we, we accept that when it comes to people in thin bodies there are some people who can eat anything they want and their bodies don't change we accept that and we accept that there must be a hormonal reason for that but when it comes to people in larger bodies it, it's out the window um <laughs> but i think I thought like that, I thought this has to be my reality. If I don't have control, then I'm just gonna, you know, become out of control. Whatever Mm -hmm. that means, that has no meaning. Um, And every time I reached a weight, that was my nightmare. Mm -hmm. I realized that my life continued. My friends still love me. My family still love me. Um, My partner still love me. Mm -hmm. And once I was able to sit in that, and I think also be away from people, because people, as we're saying, are one of the biggest you know driving factors for why we do the things we do and approval and Mm -hmm. so being alone in quarantine I just listened to my therapist for the first time Mm -hmm. I said okay fine I'll keep the ice cream in the fridge um fine I'll eat I'll eat what if I wake up this morning and I want Wendy's or I want KFC I'll go I don't need to force myself to eat a salad when I tell you that my relationship to my body and food changed within the space of it took a while It took a while because it took my body to kind of restore itself from all the deprivation and restore. So there were days where I just wanted, you know, only what I call now nutrient void foods, Mm -hmm. foods that don't have nutrients. But before it was, you know, I go to a restaurant and there's a salad on the menu. Why would I have the salad if I had salad all all week? Now I want to, you know, quote unquote, eat um, everything that I see on the menu, which again is fine. But if you're doing it because you're deprived, then it's not a sustainable way to have a relationship with food that's nourishing. It has nothing to do with your body um, being too big or too small. It's just, you know, changing your relationship to food um, so that it's something that serves you, so that you control food, not food controls you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't think that was possible because, again, I'm coming from a place where I'm saying, not me, that's everyone else's hill. My hill is that I have to um, be restricted. And now I wake up and I can actually, I'm still struggling, but this is the first time in my life where I genuinely wake up and I'm like, what do I, I, do I need energy today? Um, Should I, should I have a kale salad? Um, Do I, what did, like I ate dairy yesterday. It kind of made me feel a little sick. Um, Maybe today I want, you know, a different nutrient. Like Mm -hmm. that's a place that before I couldn't even hear my hunger. So even thinking about, you know, what foods could go into my body wasn't even possible. But I, I want that for everyone. I want that for everyone, no matter what their body is. Um, and of course, there's a class barrier, like a big, 
right. a big part of why I was able to do that was because I was home and I wasn't, you know, having to, to buy all of my foods. People don't really have the time under capitalism to plan their meals or to think about meals in that way. So again, it's all interconnected. This isn't just a individual, you need to fix your health, you need to fix your life. This right. is why, so if you have so much to say, then fucking help me fix it then. Mm-hmm. Help me fix it. <laughs> um, yeah. There's, you said a lot and <laughs> I, which was, it was so great. Um, one thing that you said was the idea of like the blue eyes, right? And then the body of like, there is no ideal body type. And I think that's so important to remember and that there's no one normal for everybody, right? Like somebody's normal is like you said, 500 pounds. Somebody else's normal is 120 pounds and get like, I want everyone to know that. Like, I want the whole world to know that we don't all have to look like supermodels that we see in magazines and walking down the runway. Like, that's a genetic mutation that happens for some people, and that's not the norm. And how can we think about our bodies in a way where we don't even have to think about them anymore, where they're not this burden on us every single day, but it's I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have to wake up and think about my body every day. I just want to be in my body and just be. And that's really nice how you were saying about, you know, especially in quarantine, you've been able to wake up and just be, and just feel like, what do I feel like today? Not, not these pressures from other people of like, I'm supposed to eat this thing and I'm not supposed to eat that other thing. And I, it, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think until like, right this very moment i've even realized that quarantine probably has had such an impact on that where i have not been around other people we have not been around other people and because of that there's been like this expedited healing that's been able to happen because we're not looking at other people all day we're not seeing what other people are eating we're not hearing from other people in our ears talking about what we can and cannot eat and that has been very powerful and like you i've i've been able to accept myself and 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 just be a little bit more and naya how you were saying a little bit right like (laughs) It, it's it's a it's a lifetime journey that I am gonna have to deal with for the rest of my life. You're gonna have to deal with for the rest of your life. We're all gonna have to deal with for the rest of our lives. But how can we make being here on planet Earth like a little bit more pleasant and a little bit easier? Exactly. And for the people who are coming after us because it's not giving at all. No, <laughs> deep rooted. <laughs> it's really? deep rooted. Yeah. And Naya, what is your experience in quarantine? How has that felt? I have always said quarantine was a dream. I loved it. <laughs> um, just having the opportunity to, to um, be quiet and just listen to me. I feel like, like you guys said, you know, being out in a world where you're constantly around people having to hear everyone's thoughts, opinions, and, you know, on you, but you never get to sit back and think, okay, well, what do I think about me? Mm-hmm. So um, it was just a lot of just like listening and just like talking to myself, a lot of conversations I would have, and I would answer back because, you know, that was, just, I never realized how much I just needed myself in that time, as opposed to, you know, everyone else needing me or me needing someone else to talk to. I really needed myself. So quarantine was great. Um, <laughs> I'll do it again. <laughs> and, um, you know, just, you know, having that time, you, I never realized how much I needed that. So I'm grateful for that time being quarantined with, as far as my relationship with food, I could pay attention. There was actually moments of time where I'd wake up and I'm like, what am I going to eat today? Like, I'm excited to cook something, figure out what I'm going to, you know, what I'm going to chow down on. You know, that was such an exciting moment to me. And I really, really, really needed that. So I'm glad. That's such a great silver lining of this disaster of the world that we live in. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, Amanda, you've brought up like violence against bigger bodies, larger bodies. For somebody who might not understand what that really means, can you explain that? And what does that look like in all the different ways that it could look? I think people in bigger bodies are treated like purgatory. They're treated like a transition that is waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. They're treated with their body first and not the fact that there are human beings inside of them. And it's fatness has been so demonized that people cannot look past fatness like it's it's fatness first person second 
Mm-hmm. And that is a problem. Like physical feature being more important than person sounds very familiar. Mm-hmm. Sounds very familiar. And even if people, you know, there are a lot of people who get really upset when fat phobia is, is grouped with things like transphobia or, or ableism or colorism. But I personally know from the research that I've done that fat phobia is actually historically rooted in racism Mm -hmm. and that there were periods of time where fat bodies weren't even termed to be different they were there were times you know we have posts on our page and anyone who's listening to this who feels doubtful there are tons of posts with historical context and information about how fatness became demonized over time for example the bmi was created by a white eugenicist who was just he wasn't even a medical person he was just having fun doing his little science um doing his he was an astronomer and he was a mathematician and he was actually obsessed this is the 18 somethings so this is you know it's giving colonialism it's giving (laughs) racism it's giving all of it Mm -hmm. um so he was just finding different ways to standardize people he just he was trying to find ways to find the ideal man that was his free time his experiments and so one of the things he did was he went around and sampled white men's weights and and made you know a distribution chart and was like okay this is where the normal weight is this is the ideal man Mm -hmm. (laughs) right right so the bmi was not even used in medical situations until health insurance needed ways to share um, policies. So it gave people a a way and companies a way to justify charging people more. Um, And it has become such an important part of medical evaluations. There are professions that you need to submit your BMI for in order to be eligible. And it actually doesn't make any sense. It doesn't take into account muscle. It doesn't take into account genetic difference. It doesn't take into account pretty much anything. And it doesn't take into account the fact that we're not in the 18 somethings anymore. (laughs) So there's just, you know, a ton of different things. We live a very different lifestyle. I could go into the science, but it's it's just (laughs) the violence is unreal it's also it's not new there's violence there are ways that people are enacting violence on bodies particularly as i said earlier the connection between just the lack of access to health that particularly like you know i don't like making claims about you know black them bodies being bigger because i don't want to like race is also a construct that was made up which we can get into as well um so i don't want to kind of like solidify this biological difference but at the end of the day the facts are that four out of five black women are considered overweight on the bmi um and so given that given the fact that we know that and given the fact that we know that black women's bodies are disposed of in every other area and realm of the world it doesn't seem coincidental that it's something that is used again to um discriminate and dispose of bodies And it's unfortunate because when you really look into the history of things, like some of these things seem really wild now because for some reason, propaganda and just the way that the world works with media has positioned America and just the world to be this like happy and progressive place. But like the history of the way that medical discrimination has functioned, like the ways in which they left black people to die in hospital beds, it's not a stretch that they're continuing to do this in ways that are more subtle. Um, So yeah, I I consider the use of the BMI and the discarding of, of people in larger bodies as genocide i do and and that might be you know a a radical opinion but i think it's slow death i think it's telling people it's it's giving people fear of going to a doctor yeah so when someone has an illness they're not going to go as fast enough i see that as 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 genocide enacted on a group of people and that's my opinion and it's not going to change and it's unacceptable and no one should stand by it and that's just one the medical industry is one of several several ways the the fact that you know seating um you know access to spaces Mm -hmm. is is all limited it's like basic basic necessities that we consider um people should have people in larger bodies are, are just completely left out which to me 
it's like a human rights issue it's a social justice issue it's a mental health issue it's a physical health issue it's an issue period um it's violence uh, i'm like call me we'll talk about it <laughs> i'll be there <laughs> totally i hear you because you're saying right the the when we start to put restrictions on actual space like physical space and and um that is something that like even goes back to the beginning of our conversation like body versus self and like how do we separate those two things right. back to unplug like how do you want to see it grow what are your hopes and dreams for it what do you want people to know about it yeah what does the future look like for you great question <laughs> We're taking it day by day, but I think it's tricky. It's it's anxiety inducing. It keeps me up at night. It's yeah. it's mm -hmm. also exciting and hopeful and happy. It's wanting to really change the way that all of these industries function. Um, whether it's the wellness industry, I want to see it address um, these issues that we're talking about. I want to see the medical industry change. I want to see the fashion industry change. Yeah. And that's, I think, where me and Naya's real, like, biggest focus is right now, just because I've been thinking about it lately. There's an entire industry that is dedicated to picking apart women's bodies. Yeah. And, I, and I think we know that on a basic level, but I've been thinking about it in terms of, like, before the Grammys, E! News literally has, like, an hour dedicated to being, like, where's the dress from your body looks amazing blah 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 so if we are saying you know bodies aren't objects you should just be able to be in them blah 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 but like there's magazine covers that are saying you know she has cellulite on the beach right like there's just no way there's just no way um so i think the future of unplugged looks like actually seeing representation which is something that we're able to do right now you know we've we've had campaigns with nike we're, we're speaking to really big companies internally. Like, it's amazing um, to kind of see that representation happening, but also making sure that reform comes along with that. Um, and we want to have a manifesto, a list of things that we're, we're really encouraging companies to do to support us and to support mm -hmm. our mission. And I think fat phobia affects everyone, including people in thin bodies, um, yep. as, as does, as do most forms of oppression. Um, but some the people the more marginalized you are the harder it hits and it's something that everyone needs to be a part of so I hope that this becomes like a nationwide worldwide um, mission and we're just doing what we can through social media but everyone on the team is so dedicated and I think everyone on the team sees that vision the same way that I do I think very very big um, I've always, when Unplug had 50 followers, I was like, yeah, no, this is, this is it. Like this page is going to blow. And I, I, and I promise you that, like, I've always believed in Unplug and so has literally almost everyone. So like, I think that collective energy is going to lead to things that people have never seen before. And I'm excited, but also kind of scared. Um, mm -hmm. so we're just taking it day by day. <laughs> That's so cool. I I just I have to just say like thank you so much for the community that you've built because personally I have used your page as a resource and learned about historical information, flaws in the medical industry, flaws in the fashion industry, and I've passed that on to other people and I just hope my hope is that more people have more eyeballs on it and it does become like this national movement and hopefully international movement um so it's it's really incredible what you're doing and i just thank you from the bottom of my heart because it's been really helpful for me on a personal level and i also really liked what you said about we're we're told you know that we have to look a certain way but then we're also told like women are incredible you're beautiful don't listen to what other people say and that is such talk about like the stress yeah. of that <laughs> that really resonates with me and i'm sure with so many other people because it's like who do, what, what do we listen to who do we believe what are we supposed to believe yeah thank you for thanking us and thank you for <laughs> creating this space um to have this conversation consistently um and to bring people on and to give people a platform to talk about it. it it really means a lot that's so kind and i it's like the least i could do you know i feel 
Like it is definitely such a community. And the only way that we're going to be able to fight this battle is if we all contribute in some way. And it's something that has affected me since I'm a little girl. And like I said, will continue to affect me forever. And just being able to talk with other people and to get more information, information is power. And that has been so eye opening to me and has been a really incredible way for me to heal and to just pass on the information because it's important. We appreciate it most definitely. Well, I'm so excited to obviously keep following and to keep reading. And Naya, I'm so excited to see more content from you. And if you don't mind, just can you tell everybody like where they can learn more and how they can follow along? For Unplugged Collective, always www. <laughs> the unplugged collective.com that's their blog space and um, we can get all the stories all you know access to any information that you're wanting to see of course on our instagram unplugged collective um we have personal pages amanda if you'd like to shout out yours you can <laughs> yes <laughs> we have gemini yeah um which oh is you know, on instagram um g-e-m-e i mean sorry g-e-m-i-n-y dot a um amazing content creator i'm not just gassing her um <laughs> it's giving the girls more than most of the girls are giving um <laughs> my personal page is amanda liz taylor pretty straightforward i'm not not an influencer by any means she's chair. still cute though you <laughs> <laughs> can thirst follow all day <laughs> oh man you guys thank you so much and we'll talk soon of course thank you bye. Bye. have a great day bye bye bye